All right, why don't we pray? We're going to be in Genesis, the end of 21 and most of 22. And arguably, Genesis 22 is my favorite chapter in the Old Testament. Amazing passage. So uh, we're going to look at that and we'll jump right into it. So let's pray together. (laughs) Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for just the gift of your presence and how you have revealed yourself in your holy word. And I thank you that you don't just leave it up to us to try to understand what you are declaring in your word, but you've given us your Holy Spirit that gives us understanding, that you would enlighten our minds and open our eyes and soften our hearts, that we might truly understand and apply and live what you have revealed in your word. So because this time is about getting to know you and growing in our faith and love of you, I pray, Lord, that you would bless us in that way. Give me the words to speak and to communicate clearly what you have already said. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before the review section, I just... Yes, Jenny. Thank you. Psalm 27, 4. Extra credit. All right. Ooh, 122. It is... It is repeated, isn't it? All right. Well, I told you guys about the little game I've been playing with the kids in the morning to school. And we do truths about God. So tell me one truth about God. And one of the kids will raise their hand and say, well, God is this. And then say, well, is he? How do we know? What does the Bible say about it? Can we prove that truth from scripture? Great time. Well, one came up this morning and it's God is faithful. And they said, that's a good one. But what does faithful mean? And I think it's important for us to revisit at times the faithfulness of God. And what it means is if someone makes a promise and they don't follow through on that promise, are they faithful? No, they're unfaithful. When a spouse breaks their marriage covenant and cheats on their spouse, we refer to that as being unfaithful, correct? They made a vow, they made a promise, they did not keep that promise. And when God says that he is faithful, it's in reference to his great promises. That God has made these promises to us. And so I asked my kids, I said, has God ever not kept a promise? They're like, no, that's right. God always keeps his promises. I said, can you imagine if God was all powerful and all knowing, but not faithful? That he would betray you, that he would turn on you that he would not keep his promises that he made to you. That would be a scary situation, wouldn't it? And yet, I know several people at this point and season in their life, they are going through the most difficult trials they have faced yet. What truth about God do you think they need to know at this season? God is faithful. God keeps his promises, but we need to also revisit what promises has God made. Some people think that God has made the promise that if you believe in him, your life will be easy. Is that a true statement? No, God has not made that promise, has he? He has promised that he will work all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Guess what's in that category of all things? Really good things and really bad things. And we're going to experience all of them through the whole entirety of our life. We're going to have good seasons, bad seasons, really bad times, really good times. Every one of them is meant to point us to Jesus more but to stand firm on those promises. What has his word actually declared to you and me? That if you believe in Christ, you'll have eternal life. That's a great promise, isn't it? That he promises to be with you through the trials and suffering. That you don't have to go through it alone. That he is already working on your behalf before you even pray for help. There are some great promises, and I think we need to remind ourselves at times that God is faithful always. Amen? Amen. Because if you have a poor understanding of what God has actually promised, you will conclude God is not faithful. 
and you will lose faith and trust in him, not because he lets you down, but because you had an unbiblical expectation placed on the Lord. You believed a promise that wasn't actually a promise. For instance, this is a hard one for some parents. Raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they are older, they will not depart from it. Is that a promise being made? Because a lot of parents have taken it as an absolute promise. That that means if I raise my child in the Lord, it is guaranteed they will walk with the Lord forever one day. I hope that is the case. But what it actually is, is a principle. It's not treated as a promise in Scripture, which is not saying that's a bad thing, but it's treated as a biblical principle. That if you commit your child to the Lord and you continue to raise them in the Lord, God is going to bring about his plan and will for their life in his time and in his way. But for the person who sees that as an absolute promise, when their child is not walking with the Lord, what's their conclusion? God lied to me. God is unfaithful. Because it's a misunderstanding of what God's actually saying. It doesn't mean that every single absolute child that's raised in the Lord will never turn away. I wish that was the case. But what it's saying is that you invest and you sow that good seed in that child and God will bring about his plan and purpose and fruit in their life. Right? Now, if you don't raise them in the Lord, the chances of them walking in the Lord are much less, aren't they? So raise them in the Lord. Trust that God's going to do his gracious work in their life. But understand that that's not a hard and fast promise. Believe in the Lord and you'll be saved. That is that God will work all things for good. That is. So we have to understand what's a promise and what's a principle that God gives. But with that said, who are the main characters in Genesis 21 of last week? Who can remember without looking? Uh, I I saw a bunch of heads pop up. That was good. What's that? Okay, Abimelech. He's going to come in more on the second part of 21. Who's more at the beginning? Okay, Abraham's the main character, right? Okay, Hagar, right? And who's her son? Yeah, Jenny, you're right. (laughs) Everybody else is wrong because they didn't raise their hand. All right, Hagar, Ishmael, Abraham. Who else? There's an important person being left out. Isaac, kind of a big deal, right? Anybody else? One more? Sarah, right? Those are all the main characters of Genesis 21. What major milestone just happened in Isaac's life? I use milestone for a reason. He stopped nursing, nursing, right? He was weaned. Now he was a big boy and he can eat food. So what did Abraham's father do for his son Isaac? Threw a big feast. Now remember, Abraham is exceedingly wealthy and powerful. Arguably more wealthy and powerful than many of the kings in the area, right? Right? And so it might have been from his Egyptian vacation and all that Pharaoh gave him and then his, his vacation to Philistine and all that Abimelech gave him, um, you know, prostituting his wife out basically is not really what he did, but it seems like it. Uh, but he got a lot of things. He was a very wealthy man. God blessed him in a lot of ways. So when he threw a feast, dude knew how to throw a feast, right? And it was a big deal. But how did Ishmael respond? He mocked him. I wonder if Abraham threw a big feast for Ishmael when he was weaned. I see a big parallel between the prodigal son and the older son who stayed home in the Gospels and the jealousy and rivalry there that the younger son took his inheritance, blew it all on loose living. He came back. His father was so happy to see him. He ran to welcome him home, put his robe on him, put a ring on his finger, threw a great feast, And who had a problem with it? The older brother. The one who stayed home, who didn't blow his inheritance, right? You can understand some of his frustration. So here you have Ishmael mocking little Isaac about, oh, little baby eating food, you know, picking on him. And he was a teenager at the time. All right? Sounds about right. So he was 13 when Isaac was born. Isaac was weaned probably around two to four years old. So he's around 15 to 17. And he mocks Isaac. So what does Sarah want Abraham to do? 
Yes. And it's interesting that Sarah refers to her as the slave woman. She doesn't say her as the name. She doesn't say Hagar. She doesn't say the woman that I gave you to be your wife. She says the slave woman and her son. She doesn't say your son, even though he was Abraham's son. She said, kick him out. What's her reason? What does she say? Yes, yes. <laughs> right, and she makes the bold statement, he will not be an heir with my son Isaac. Now, Abraham is like, that's my son, that's my son. He's not too happy with Sarah right now. And he maybe was ready to put her on blast. And what does God say to Abraham? Why do the ladies like that one so much? <laughs> Listen to your wife. Yes. God said to Abraham, you need to shut your mouth and listen to your wife. Do what she says. Don't be displeased with the boy. God's basically saying, I'm allowing this for a reason. Because if Ishmael stuck around, he's the firstborn. All that inheritance would have gone to him. And yet the promise was always meant to be through Isaac, right? Not just Abraham's son, but Abraham and Sarah's son. That's who the blessing would be through. And so the inheritance, Isaac needed to be considered the firstborn. Because in all intents and purposes, Ishmael wasn't supposed to be around. They were supposed to wait for the promised child, Isaac. They didn't. They tried to make God's plans happen on their own. Anybody good at trying to make God's plans happen on your own? Doesn't work out so well, does it? It's funny, sometimes when we let go, God then does his part, doesn't he? And so you'll see kind of how this unfolds with Abraham. He kicks out Hagar and Ishmael, but how does he provide for them when he sends them away? Jenny? Yep. Water and bread, two main life-giving elements that they need. They're in a land called Beersheba. Anybody remember what Beersheba means? Amanda? It means a well. Now, last week, I taught it like it was already that name. But reading on later, that region doesn't take on the name Beersheba until the passage we read tonight with Abraham and Abimelech and what happens with them over a well, a dispute that they have. So Moses is writing about that region using the name that the Jewish exiles would have understood. But it actually wasn't called Beersheba yet when Hagar and Ishmael went there to die. That's basically what happened. She puts him under a bush, goes a hundred yards away, called a bow shot, and she's ready to watch her son die from a distance. And the angel of the Lord tells her she's heard the boy's cries. He's gonna, God's going to make him a great nation as well to pick him up. And there, right before her, is water that she didn't expect to see. And so God sustained her and him, and she took a wife for Ishmael from what? nation Egypt where she was from thereby solidifying the fact that Ishmael was not a part of the line and lineage of Abraham because now Ishmael and his descendants were on the Egyptian line and lineage and not the covenant lineage that God had set aside through Isaac okay so that's where we're going with that why don't we go ahead and read Genesis 1 22 to the end Stand with me in honor of God's word, and we'll read that. And we might even read into Genesis 22. So I don't plan on saying a lot about the end of 21. Genesis 21, 22. At that time, Abimelech and Fickle, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. This is a covenant and agreement made between these men. We'll get into who he is in a moment. But when Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. 
So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Fickle, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. You can be seated. I just want to comment on these two paragraphs for a moment before we jump in to Genesis 22 with Abraham and Isaac. But in this section, we see that Abraham is approached by two men. Abimelech, who is he? What is his position and title? Anybody? He's a king of the Philistines. Now remember who is reading the book of Genesis for the first time the people that Moses recorded all of this for. It, are the, it is the Jews who were slaves in Egypt who are now going to go into the promised land, the land that God promised to Abraham and his offspring. God said, I will give you the land of your sojournings. The land of his sojournings. Where did he sojourn? In the land of the Philistines. So guess whose land God is going to give to Abraham and his offspring? The land of the Philistines. But there's a problem. There is a covenant and an agreement that is made where Abraham and Abimelech promise to one another that they will deal well with one another and with the land and not deal falsely, correct? There was a mutual agreement that was met. So somewhere along the line in the history, we will get to a point where there is a breach of this covenant and there is a clear departure from what they agreed upon. But for now, they make this agreement that Abraham will deal well with them. They will deal well with him. But why would Abimelech bring Fickle, the commander of his army, with him? First time we hear about this guy. In case something went down, right? You bring your baddest warrior with you. If you're a king, especially if you're meeting with a guy like Abraham. Now we think of Father Abraham. He's meek and mild and he's just a kind guy. But remember, he's the one who led a few hundred of his men armed to the teeth and conquered you see, four or five armies of the king of Sodom and others without the help of any others those 300 special forces guys took them all out. Abraham was a bad dude, even at 100 years old. And he was as powerful as any king. So Abimelech comes, and he's got his commander of his army with him as maybe a little intimidation factor, but also some protection in case things go south. So they make this agreement. Abraham gives sheep and oxen, then he sets aside these lambs when there's a disagreement. You see, Abimelech's servants stole the well, claimed that it was theirs all along, and now Abimelech is saying, hey, I didn't know about it. Do we know if that's the truth or not? Scripture doesn't tell us, but we know that Abimelech was already a man of his word, wasn't he? When Sarah came into his harem, basically, and he didn't touch her, and he said to God, I have done nothing wrong, I didn't know, and God's like, you're right, you didn't. So there's no indication biblically that we should believe that Abimelech is lying right now. But his servants took something that belonged to Abraham. Abraham, being a righteous man, wanted to make sure that nobody could claim that he stole the well from Abimelech. So he took more livestock. He set those seven aside and said, these are evidence that I dug this well. And Abimelech agreed. So from then on, that well was his. It belonged to the people of Israel later after. But we see something that happens at the end of that. Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. And we'll see God's people taking possession of that. I want you to stand again.
Feel like you're in Catholic Mass? It's good. That's why Catholics live so long. Up and down and healthy. It's awesome, right? So check this out. Genesis 22. After these things, God tested Abraham. Oh, wouldn't you love that to be written about yourself? And then God tested, put your name there. You don't want that, right? But it comes. And God said to him, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Not a good conversation with the Lord, is it? So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy, or do anything to him. For, I know, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will. Those are words of promise. These are promises. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at ba Beersheba. And then we'll get to the rest later. Why don't you be seated? This is a very important redemptive passage in Genesis 22. Now let's think about all that took place in that and where God has led Abraham thus far. God did not just one day tell Abraham, okay, time to kill your son. God prepared him, did he not? Think about what just happened with Hagar and Ishmael. God told Abraham to let go of Hagar, someone who he had an intimate relationship with, to let go of Ishmael, his son. Do you think that was an initial test? Was that difficult for Abraham to do what God was telling him to do? Yes. Was it more difficult than him having to kill his own son? No. And a lot of people have real difficulty with this chapter. They go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why would God ever tell somebody, you need to go kill your only begotten son? That's like somebody who has mental illness, who hears voices, and they believe that they're supposed to kill all their kids and drive them into the water, right? You think of that type of mental illness, but there is something God is specifically doing here that God did with Abraham that he has not done with other people. God is not going to come to you and say, okay, I want to know if you really trust me. It's time to kill so-and-so. That is not God's plan or mode of operation for us 
for his people. This is what he did for one man at one time for one very specific prophetic purpose. Abraham symbolizes God the Father and Isaac always symbolizes God the Son. And when you see in light of the New Testament, we use that to interpret the Old Testament. We start to understand why the New Testament says all of Scripture speaks of Christ. Everything that happened. So Abraham had let go of Hagar and Ishmael. But look at what God says. In verse 1 of chapter 22, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Was that Abraham's only son? Technically, no. Redemptively, yes. He was his only son. Why? Because Ishmael was no longer a part of Abraham's family and covenant. He was already probably 17 years old at that time. Now, with the time of Isaac, Ishmael was much older now. Because remember, he had 13 years head start on Isaac. So by the time Isaac is a teenager, which he is at this point, Ishmael is close to 30. He's not a child anymore, but he's also, in the regards to the covenant, not considered Abraham's son at this point. Isaac is considered his only son because he was a child of promise. But God says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning. There's a reason why Abraham is called the father of faith. Think about the faith that he has here. He has waited a long time to have that child, didn't he? He and Sarah. How do you think he's going to explain that to Sarah? <laughs> Honey, listen. God spoke to me. It's not good news. Say your goodbyes. Now, I don't hear Sarah mentioned here. Could it have been Abraham just rose early in the morning because he didn't want her to know what was going on? Everybody's like, yep, absolutely. So he ends up taking some servants. They pack the donkey, three days trip. They go to the land of Moriah, okay, where God told them to go. Now, if God tells somebody to go to a specific region, do you think God has a reason for it? He could have had them just go to any hill, any place, and sacrifice him. But God specifically told him to go to the land of Moriah. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, verse 3, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Do you think wood is significant in this passage? He cuts the wood. Can you imagine just being in his mindset? Cutting the wood, preparing it, knowing that that is going to fuel the flames that burn up his son. The father preparing the opportunity for the son to be sacrificed. Does that sound like God the father who prepared the opportunity for God the son to be sacrificed? So then he goes on, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Worship involves sacrifice. I wonder how many of our churches promote a style of worship that involves sacrifice. What does that mean? What does that look like in the church? I don't want to stand up. I just want to sit down and listen. That church makes me stand up all the time. Is there not a sacrifice? I mean, if God himself, Christ, the only begotten Son of God, walked in here, I would say that you would stand up out of respect and honor, but realistically, we'd all fall on our face. We'd be done. Like, it says that Isaiah fell down as if he was dead. 
when he caught a glimpse of God in all his majesty. Christ is not humble and covered up like he was in his earthly ministry. He's now glorified. He is shining and bright and beautiful in every way. And so we would be humbled and on our face. And yet we want to worship God without anything required of us. Don't we? Just like we want to be skinny and fit without ever working out or doing hard work. We do, right? We're just like, God, just make me look the way I want to look. And it's like, well, there's some things that we kind of need to do maybe, right? Take some responsibility. The same thing spiritually. We don't want to put in the work. And yet, Abraham put in the work. He cut the wood. He sacrificed. He made the opportunity possible to obey the Lord. Do you think there is anything to be said about Isaac's obedience to his father? He's a smart kid. He's like, okay, I've been around plenty of sacrifices, and there's three necessary elements. There's a knife, there's fire, and there's a sacrifice. We got two of the three. Like, Dad, what's the deal? Like, where's the sacrifice? Abraham gives the total dad answer. God's going to provide. Do you think Isaac was really comfortable with that decision? Or when he goes, hey, Isaac, you know, here's this wood. Um, lay down for me real quick. I'm just going to tie you here. No big deal. You know, just trust me. What are you doing with the knife, Dad? Oh, nothing. And yet Isaac willingly allowed himself to be bound to the wood. Did Jesus not willingly lay himself down upon the wood of the cross? And instead of bound to it, he was nailed to it. Who nailed him to it? Was it really the Romans? God the Father is the one who nailed his son upon that cross. It's God the Father who, according to his sovereign plan, used the wickedness of sinful man to sacrifice his own son. And we see that in Abraham and Isaac. That is why God spoke to Abraham because he wanted to show God's people and people of all generations and ages that there will be a father who offers up his son and that he did not have Abraham do it because God himself would do it. God did not ask Abraham to do anything that God would not be willing to do. How important is that? God was willing to do it himself, and God did do it himself in the person of Christ. But he takes the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. They're going up Mount Moriah. Abraham's a hundred and something years old at this point, probably 113 or above. Isaac, guess who gets to carry the wood? The sacrifice. And he lays it on his son. How do you think Isaac carried the wood? On his back. Up a hill. Why did God choose Mount Moriah? It is the same mountain. It is the same mountain of the Lord. And that is why Isaac, the promised son, carries the wood up the hill and is bound to it because Jesus, God's only son, whom he loves. The same thing God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son whom you love. God, all the while knowing he's speaking to himself, I will one day take my son, my only son whom I love, and I will sacrifice him upon that mountain for you and for me. And so Isaac said to his father, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb. So they went both together. Verse nine, when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Can you imagine what Abraham was going through in this moment? He didn't know how this story ends. We do. 
He didn't know. And here he is ready to sacrifice the promise God gave him to let it all die. And yet, when he reached up, took the knife to slaughter his son, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Is this just an angel? The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is almost always the second person of the Trinity, Christ the Son. Jesus is the one who said, Abraham, Abraham. Can you imagine Abraham's response? Oh, I'm so glad you called my name. <laughs> like, jeez. Like, do you really have to wait till the last minute, you know? And, and yet he calls his name two times. It means you better listen up. How many times? It's basically the equivalent of saying the first, middle, and last name when your kid's in trouble, right? Joseph Philip Wozniak, that's my oldest son. And you throw it all out there and it's like, oh, better listen. Stop what I'm doing. Abraham, Abraham is always, hey, pay attention. Listen up. He told, tells him to stop. And then look at what Christ says. He says, I know you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place. The Lord will provide as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Did God not on that very same mountain provide a sacrifice for our sins? God himself, Abraham said at the beginning, God himself will provide a sacrifice for us. And so God himself spared Abraham from doing what he himself would have to do one day. That there was no angel of the Lord to cry out and stay God's hand from striking down his own son so that you and I could live forever and we would be adopted into his family. Jesus paid that price because God had promised him. Now, if Jesus is the angel of the Lord and he did not call Abraham's name, he would have killed Isaac. And yet Jesus is the one who says, I'm taking Isaac's place. And he did the same thing for you and me. If you believe in Jesus, he took your place. You should be slaughtered and I should be slaughtered for our sin. We should spend eternity apart from a holy God, never being able to behold His glory and enjoy His presence. That's what we deserve. And yet when the judgment was about to be poured out on you and me, God said, stop. And Jesus, our Savior, laid down upon that wood, was nailed to it, and died on that cross for you and for me. And God promised through Christ that He would provide that sacrifice. And then God reissues that promise in verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Now, Scripture explains that somebody would promise or swear by something greater than themselves. Okay? God swears by himself because there is nothing greater than him. He is the assurance that he will keep his promise. He says, by myself I have sworn and I do swear. He says, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. So here's that promise. God says, because you did not withhold my son, I'm going to give you as many sons as the stars in the sky. 
and the sand in the seashore. Bless you. Again. And yet, we're talking about God's blessing, are we not? And God promised to bless Abraham. Why? Because the thing Abraham cherished most, he was willing to give to the Lord. And the Lord gave him back a million billion times more. So is there not a principle there for your life and mine? The very things we hold on to, that we cherish, that we are so scared to lose, if we give them over to the Lord, He gives back so much more. And interestingly enough, Abraham thought he was going to, in fact, have to fully give his son. And God said, nope, you don't have to. He knew Abraham was willing to. And Abraham was about to. But God said, you know what? I'm so good. I'm not even going to have, have you give him up. And I'm going to give you so much more. It shows that God wants to bless us, but we can't be like a little child hoarding something, afraid that somebody's going to take it away. Now, some of our boys were in a foster care environment before us where they weren't fed all the time and regularly. And we'll have to catch them sometimes where they're eating like this, like guarding their food and plate. And it just happened tonight. Jen's like, buddy, breathe like nobody's going to take your food. Relax. And he's like, but he's like, don't take it. Because he's so scared that somebody's going to take it and he's not going to have it. And we get that way in our life. We think, God's going to take everything that I love. But everything we have is His. And we have to be willing to give Him everything. Every promise, every hope, every dream, lay it down at the feet of Christ and say, Lord, it's yours anyways. And if you're willing to do that, you'll be blessed more than you can imagine. And there's no telling how God's going to do that or what He's going to require of you or how it works out, but God promises that He will bless those who obey Him. And that's the thing. How important is obedience to God's commands? We live in an be easy beliefism Christianity these days where it's just say you believe in Jesus and well, yep, you're going to heaven with no transformation, no repentance, no continuing in the faith. Just this, I want to feel like I'm secure, so I'll profess faith in Jesus, but I still want to live my life my way. That's not a saving faith. That's not a faith that's continuing in the Lord and willing to lay down their life and die that they might live. And so we're not promoting an easy beliefism because Scripture doesn't. But does works save you? No. Faith alone saves you, but faith that is alone is never alone. It's accompanied by good works, by obedience to God and His commands. It shows that your faith and mine is real because now we want to please Him. Sometimes we wrestle and we still want to please ourselves more than Him, and that's how we fall into sin. But then we ask for forgiveness, we repent, but we keep striving forward in the gospel, seeking to obey Him, because that is where the blessing is. In, in surfing, there's kind of that sweet spot on the wave. If anybody grew up surfing, and when you start, sometimes you'll drop in and you'll go too far ahead of the wave and you just fizzle out and there's no power. Or you're not in it enough and you get pulled out the back. There's that sweet spot where the wave is pushing you and gliding you along the water and you're able to actually ride the wave. Obedience is that sweet spot of blessing. When you're willing to obey the Lord, you're right in it. And God's grace is propelling you forward in your life. And His blessing is there. But if you're trying to go ahead of the Lord or go behind, you, you go over the falls or you get sucked back. And it's not good. God has blessing for you and I. But Abraham was blessed because he believed God and he also obeyed Him. Why would it be any different for you and me? God expects both of those things from us. Thankfully, even though we've disobeyed Him, 
He provided a sacrifice to cover all those sins. And I don't want to leave this conversation of God's word without highlighting this one fact. If there is any sin that you have ever committed in your life that you can't seem to get past, you, you hold it against yourself, you can't seem to receive forgiveness, you feel that God's always holding it against you. If there is a sin that you've committed that is too big for God to forgive, I'm almost done. The Lord's like, wrap it up, dude, wrap it up. If you think that there's a sin that's too big or too heinous for God to forgive, what does that tell you about the value of his sacrifice? You're actually cheapening Jesus' great sacrifice for you and me. You're saying, well, you know, my sin was so bad, not even Jesus can forgive that. Really? Because that sacrifice of God's own son paid for all the sins of all people in all the world who believe in him. I'm pretty sure however bad that sin is that you committed or sins or whatever, God is more than willing and capable to absolutely blot it out and wipe it away and remove it from his remembrance. Because his sacrifice was so great, it paid for it all. There never has to be another sacrifice again. If there was, if the sacrificial system continued, that means that what Jesus did really wasn't that significant. That's why the writer of the Hebrews says there was one sacrifice once and for all for our sins, yours and mine. Why do you think God and his great plan had the Romans march in and destroy the temple in 70 AD? God did not want the sacrificial system to continue because the one true son already paid the price. No more sacrifices needed. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Genesis 22, for the beautiful parallels and preparation that Abraham and his sacrifice of Isaac reveal to us about your sacrifice of Jesus, your only begotten son. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were provided by the Father as the sacrifice for our sins that you carried the wood of the sacrifice up that hill, that you were nailed to it, and that you were lifted up. And by being lifted up above the earth, you said that you would draw all men to yourself. And that's what you have done, Lord, in us. We have been drawn to you because of your sacrifice for us and for our sins. And I pray that we would, Lord, be overcome with thankfulness and joy and faith in you, and for your great love for us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.